Hello students of art history and welcome to part two of our quick and dirty art series on the Renaissance. We're going to see the rise of the Ninja Turtle artists today and then a few others as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. First let's take a look at sculpture before the Renaissance. After the fall of Rome and then before the Renaissance period in the Dark Ages we had primarily relief sculpture. We did not have sculpture in the round or 3D sculpture, instead just relief sculpture. Which, while cool, is not nearly as cool as what we're going to see developing here under some of the Ninja Turtle artists, such as from Donatello. We're going to see Saint George, which is the first freestanding sculpture since antiquity. All right, now another sculpture that's going to be a little controversial and make some waves here is Donatello's David. All right, so his David is um, very young looking. It is very effeminate. It imitate, imitates Roman style and a number of scholars have assumed that the statue was originally commissioned by the affluent Cosimo di Medici. The work um, was done for the Medicis and then put into their home. They would not display this thing in public because it was seen as fairly controversial. All right, now the reasons for that is it is well documented that Donatello was not religious. In fact, he was openly homosexual, which was in direct conflict with both the religious and secular laws of the period. However, this did not stop him from sculpting his magnificent bronze masterpiece. And the reason, again, that this one is so cool is the first freestanding nude since the Romans and the first freestanding bronze sculpture in Western history. It is definitely a masterpiece. All right, but uh, the inspiration for this whole thing came a little bit from uh, the political atmosphere of the time. It has some political symbolism to it because if you take a look at the hat that David is wearing, it is a Florentine hat. Whereas if you look at the helmet that Goliath is wearing, the front piece to that helmet or the facial shield that he is wearing is all actually from the Venetian uh, designs that were done at the time. And so just a symbol of how Florence is on the rise and overcoming their nemeses. Also a symbol though of uh, some of the ideas of the time. For instance, uh, many men at the time in Florence for some reason felt that the only way they could find true love was with another man. And then the foot in, in the beard of Goliath was seen as a very sexualized symbol. And so again, this is a highly controversial piece that was not shown in public uh, until much later. Instead, the Medicis just said, hey, that's pretty cool, and decided to put it in one of their gardens. So there you go, Donatello giving us David. Next, we're going to take a look, though, at Leonardo da Vinci. He is the ultimate Renaissance man, myth, and legend. So we get a quote here from the world's first art historian, as they call him, a man by the name of Giorgio Vasari. And so in his famous book, Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, which he wrote right in the midst of this period of the Renaissance, he tells us, in the normal course of human events, many men and women are born with remarkable talents, but occasionally, in a way that transcends nature, a single person is marvelously endowed by heaven with beauty, grace and talent in such abundance that he leaves other men far behind. All his actions seem inspired, and indeed everything he does clearly comes from God rather than from human skill. Everyone acknowledged that this was true of Leonardo da Vinci, an artist of outstanding physical beauty who displayed infinite grace in everything that he did and who cultivated his genius so brilliantly that all problems he studied he solved with ease. Indeed, I mean, if you take a look at all of the incredible things that he did, I mean, the guy invented the designs for a tank and for a massive crossbow that could fire a flying device into the sky and then use the wings of this thing to cruise around in the air. The only problem is he couldn't really get these things actually built, but he had the designs ready. He also uh, broke the age-old taboo of not dissecting the human body to figure out exactly what was going on. Good thing he didn't get caught because that was the kind of thing that would have gotten him uh, excommunicated for sure. So, um, he is giving us some beautiful paintings though, of course. We get the Last Supper, which of course is a very famous painting, and of course has some good controversy if you decide to read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. But as we can see from this, uh, this fresco that was done in the Dominican Friary of Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan, uh, that there is a mastery of depth. There's uh, a focal point and a vanishing point which goes straight to Christ's forehead. There is our 
focal point and our vanishing point. All the lines are directed towards Christ himself. Another cool thing is that this painting is supposed to represent the moment after Christ said, one of you is going to betray me. And then all of a sudden, everyone's saying, what? Is it I? And so here we have Judas, which obviously it is him. But then we get all of these different groupings of threes in which we have the different apostles' responses. And so the grouping of threes, uh, numerology, as you recall, from the medieval and renaissance period, very important. The number three is important. And the fact that they're all in these three different groupings showing their different responses. Some are questioning and debating. Some are like, what? No way. And these guys are like, are you sure? And then he's like, oh yeah, that's totally me. I really need to get out of here and go get my silver. But the interesting thing is that when da Vinci painted this on the wall of the Dominican friary, he used a combination of oil, varnish, and a mixture of egg whites in order to try and achieve some vibrant colors. The problem is, it has faded substantially, and despite numerous restorations, it just does not seem to want to stay in place. And so, therefore, it's a great representation of, of da Vinci's famous quote, art is never finished, only abandoned. Hey, another great quote from da Vinci, obstinate rigor. I mean, the man absolutely loved the rigorous life, and he came up with all kinds of cool innovations in art to make that, uh, dis to display that as well. So here we see the Virgin and Saint Anne, and first of all, he's using chiaroscuro, and with chiaroscuro, what, they, what the artist tries to achieve is to use some different checkerboard kind of uh, shading. So let's say if we want something to be really dark, we're going to draw some lines like that and then draw some lines checkering like that. And then the further that we start to get away from our shadowing, you have fewer lines that are happening there, a little bit less uh, or a little bit more room between the uh, the checkerboards that you're making there. So a method of chiaroscuring. And as you can see, I am one heck of a Renaissance artist looking glorious there with my painting. All right, then another thing that we see that's really cool with uh, what he's doing here is atmospheric hazing. As you take a look at the atmosphere back there using chiaroscuro, he's able to blend the colors in with the clouds and make it just slowly disappear. So he gives us what the human eye does naturally in paint. Oh, beautiful. All right, so our next one, we get Michelangelo and his Pieta. So Michelangelo's Pieta has some cool stories to it. First of all, Michelangelo, when he first made this beautiful piece of marble sculpture, he was very young and he had not yet achieved single name status. Once you hit that first name status, everybody knows you're a big deal. You are the artist of the era. And so Michelangelo, not quite there yet, but Michelangelo was patronized by the church to make this sculpture that they were going to put into the Vatican. And so he decided to start carving it from marble. Now, the story goes that when he first made this thing, uh, the people who first viewed it said, there's no way that some 20-some-year-old artist carved this. This must have been someone else. And so my, Michelangelo was so angry when he heard that kind of criticism that he went into the Vatican, broke in at night, and carved his name across Mary's chest. If you take a look at it right here, carved his name across Mary's chest because he was so ticked. And the next morning, everyone was like, oh, wow, great, Michelangelo, thanks. I guess now we believe you. And in fact, he was so embarrassed after that moment, so embarrassed about uh, how he reacted that he never signed his name into another piece of artwork again. Another cool story that goes along with this is that we have this very youthful Mary who's supposed to symbolize um, incorruptible purity and youth, and she has this serene expression on her face and positions her arm so that I mean, it doesn't look like she's having to hold much weight. Obviously, Christ is going to be much heavier than what this little woman would be able to hold with a single arm. So what we see is the crucified Christ, but what it's also meant to symbolize is that Mary sees her baby son holding her baby son, and yet because Christ, from the moment of birth all the way until his death, his whole goal for being here is to be crucified for humanity's sins, what we see is the crucified Christ, not the baby Jesus. So now what we're going to see is Michelangelo's David. And David, this thing is a behemoth. I mean, it is 17 feet tall, and it is also meant to represent the glories of Florence. So whereas Donatello's David was a little bit sketchy uh, and uh, very young and effeminate, representing more than likely the historical David, since David was a young boy when he killed Goliath, here we get the grown and masculine David. Uh, uh, glorious figure here. One problem that Michelangelo had was that it was so heavy because it was so huge, he had to find a way to counterbalance it. So you can see, if you take, if you look closely here at the uh, the leg of David, we have to have a little bit of a stabilizer to prevent the weight from shifting too far to the right, uh, because we have a heavy arm that's pulling weight this way, a heavy torso that's pulling weight that way, and so in order 
order to counterbalance that, you've got one leg sticking out rather than straight down because that would defeat the purpose and he would just simply topple over and that wouldn't be any good. So we've got a leg sticking out, which is pulling the weight that way then, and then his arm pulling weight out that way as well to the opposite direction. So a great way of doing the balancing work involved here. And also we see some incredible detail as you take a look at the hand of David. Oh, beautiful. And then if you just, as you take a look at the face, it's absolutely stunning. I mean, the, the confidence, the self-confidence. This is humanist individualism right there with biblical themes behind it. So we see the Renaissance emphasis of the glories of mankind right there. But of course, it's all inspired by God himself. So um, we get some cool Renaissance ideas there, but we also get it when we take a look at, at Michelangelo's painting. He considered himself first and foremost a sculptor. In fact, when he was making his sculptures, what he did was he said that he would see a figure or see an angel inside of the marble and he would simply carve in order to free it. Now in his painting, he's going to infuse that same kind of passion and idealism. It's beautiful stuff here with Michelangelo giving us the Sistine Chapel, which he's going to spend four years on his back get, getting paid by the church, but he's arguing constantly with Julius II. Michelangelo gives us uh, the center panel here in which we see that, that he's abandoning this idea of background. Who needs to focus on background? Because the real focus here needs to be upon uh, upon the figurines. Thanks to John Green, we can see that the anato that an anatomically correct brain is actually being represented here to some extent. We also have, for the first time in human history, God is portrayed horizontally. Never in art has God been portrayed horizontally. All right, so that's a big deal. And then, boom, the moment of creation. Adam is sitting here looking serene. He's also sitting there looking powerful very uh, very ready to take on this life, but he's lifeless still. I mean, so his body, while, while primed and ready for manly escapades here, he's lifeless. And so this is the moment of oh, excitement, and all of a sudden we've got life. And then another thing that we see in the Sistine Chapel is the Last Judgment at the back of the Sistine Chapel. So Michelangelo's Last Judgment is incredible. It's so incredible, in fact, that when Pope Paul III came in, he was actually the one who commissioned this section of the chapel. When Pope Paul III came into the Sistine Chapel, he supposedly exclaimed, Lord, please don't charge me with my sins when you come on Judgment Day. Oh, man, as you take a look at this thing, first of all, it's huge. I mean, as we zoom in a little bit on the picture, this is the altar, all right? And it's a big altar. This is a door, all right? So here's a dude walking into a door, and then there you go. The chapel, the wall itself is huge. It's controversial because, first of all, uh, Michelangelo is including a number of mythological figures from antiquity, such as Charon and Minos, all right? Now, uh, also, he's including nudes in, in the back of this chapel. And the fact that saints are nude here was very controversial for the time as well. And then also, Michelangelo's own turmoil from his soul are represented here because Michelangelo, according to sources of the time, indicate that he was a homosexual as well and he really had a hard time reconciling his faith with his homosexuality. And so he uh, tried to become an ascetic in, in order to avoid some of the uh, the sin that he felt as he you know, was feeling an affinity for other men. So his last judgment, if we zoom in on it a little bit, we can see the figure of Christ and Mary here. Now the bodies of Christ and Mary, Mary were modeled after pagan sources in art. They were modeled after Apollo and Venus. Now why, you might ask? That sounds controversial. Well, Michelangelo, as a humanist, felt that the power of Christianity was eclipsing the former glories of antiquity and pagan theology. He felt that Christ was more powerful than Apollo, and he felt that Mary represents the transformation and power of Christian love to displace pagan love. And then we see with Bartholomew, as you zoom in on Bartholomew's picture here, he's a saint because he was martyred by getting flayed alive, skinned alive. So here you can see his soul throughout the rest of eternity looking up at Christ over his right shoulder, uh, showing the knife saying, hey, yo, this was for you, brother, and then holding in his left hand his skin all right, then down below, you start to go a little deeper into the pits of hell, and you can see these nasty little demonic spirits that are dragging these souls to he down to hell, and he does not look too happy, does he? He's regretting those decisions, definitely. All right, and then we have uh, a fun story here with this guy. This is uh, Biagio de Cisna. All right, he uh, didn't like the fact that there were nudes. He felt that they were out of place, and so he was... Uh, the papal master of ceremonies, and so he said that the painting made the chapel look like a uh, stufa de ignudi, which means a bathing house. And for that remark, which 
Michelangelo overheard him say to the Pope, Michelangelo put his face on Minos, the great judge of hell, and gave him donkey ears. Ha <laughs> ha, got that one. Don't piss off the artist. That's the lesson there. All right, next we have Raphael, Raphael Sanzio. And Raphael Sanzio, uh, to become Raphael, because he will be, of course, famous enough to achieve first name status, Raphael is the youngest of the three great high Renaissance masters and youngest of the Ninja Turtle artists here. And he learned from both Da Vinci and Michelangelo. He apparently had a very deep admiration for both of them. And Michelangelo, who was just across the hall in the Sistine Chapel painting on his back for four years, and he kept kind of popping over to be like, uh, hey, uh, Michelangelo, I like you. And Michelangelo would casually ignore him most of the time because he was not always very happy or very approachable. Now, as we take a look at the School of Athens, you can see that it is skillfully expressing the classical ideas of beauty, serenity, and harmony. First of all, because it's on one of the walls of the Vatican, which means that humanism had infiltrated all aspects of elite society, culture, and religion, and it was being espoused by the church at this point. We also see the statue of Apollo. Uh, we can see that he is the patron, the godlike patron of the arts, especially poetry. And then as we take a look around the room, we can see a lot of different figures that are representative of the glories of the ancient world. So for instance, Ptolemy with his math tablet there. We can also see this guy. He's kind of fun. This is Diogenes. Diogenes was a wrestler. He was a Greek, uh, and he was seen as a, a glorious philosopher of the time because he just didn't care what anybody else thought. In fact, frequently what he would do is he would just strip down to the nude and walk around just because he thought, why the heck not? Sometimes he would even uh, um, squat down and defecate in public because he thought, I don't care. I don't care what anybody thinks. Then if we also zoom in on the centerpiece of this school of Athens, we can see uh, the figures of Plato and Aristotle represented, where Plato is emphasizing philosophical theories. He points to the sky, and Aristotle is emphasizing empiricism. Now you can also see that the figure of Plato is represented by Leonardo da Vinci. And then if you take a look around, Michelangelo is sitting there brooding. All right, and, and Raphael was being clever here. Apparently he was put off by Ma Michelangelo on several occasions, and so, uh, so Raphael decided to put him in the painting as the pessimistic, brooding philosopher Heraclitus. And so Michelangelo getting a little bit, again, you don't, you don't piss off the artist. They'll put you somewhere where you kind of look goofy. And then, of course, Raphael's also going to put himself in the painting as well. And so he tells us, yeah, I'm here. I did this, and he is the only figure out of all of the many figures in the School of Athens that is looking directly out at the viewer, as if to say, yeah, better believe it. And then here we see the Raphael and his transfiguration of Christ. So the story goes that Christ went up on the mount and then was transfigured in front of his, uh, a few of his disciples between the prophets Moses and Elijah. And then we have the distraught disciples that are there on the ground. But just below the, this scene, you can also see uh, another story from the Bible in which some people were bringing a, a boy that was possessed. Some parents were bringing the boy to see Christ and the disciples that were at the bottom of the mountain were saying, no, leave him alone. You know, Christ is busy right now. Don't bother him. And so here we see again that idea of the narrative style because uh, as you divide the painting in half, there's a story going on here, story going on here, and then we get bits and pieces of that as we take a look at it. All right, then we also, if you take a look at the foreground, we have a woman that is being portrayed right here, and her name is Julia Farnese. All right, she was a mistress of the Pope at the time. That guy was Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope. And so he was uh, had himself a favorite mistress who they nicknamed the Sposa di Cristo, which means the Bride of Christ, because she shared his bed so frequently. So you can see the papal patronage there. The Pope at one point was like, hey, throw my lady in the picture. Oh, shameful. Shameful and disgusting. All right, and then we get a, a couple of other non-Ninja Turtle artists here, such as Titian. It is not pronounced Titian. It is pronounced Titian, just so you know. So here we have Titian giving us Cardinal Pietro Bembo. All right, now this is another cool example of the Renaissance because we have some secularism combining with his desire for individualism and the fact that he's a religious guy giving patronage to the arts, and therefore we get the Renaissance. And then if we go north a little bit to the Northern Renaissance, we see some artists that are of note, such as Albrecht Dürer. He gives us a self-portrait. Now, Albrecht Dürer is really cool because he went down to Italy to get his training, and in fact, he learned under some of the greats, uh, and then he goes up to back to the north because he said, here I am a master, at home I am a parasite. 
all right? But he decided he wanted to go back home because unless you are a uh, getting patronage from people like the Medicis or the church, you're not going to make much money as an artist. So Albrecht Durer is the first Renaissance painter to be independently wealthy from his work, not through patronage, but by selling his artwork to individuals on the street. So he gives himself noble attire, even though he is not seen as a nobleman, as since he's an artist, he is giving himself noble attire, attire to say, look, I'm awesome, I'm skilled, I know what I'm doing, more than some nobleman does, certainly. And he's signing it! So you can see the signature there with the AD for Albrecht Durer. And so he is definitely confident. And when you can paint such cool things as this incredibly detailed rabbit, again with the signature at the bottom, obviously you should feel pretty good about yourself, right? This would be the kind of thing that he'd be selling on the street, some of the ink and paper types of drawings that he'd be doing, and people would be buying these as uh, postcards and placards like crazy. They loved it. And here we get a lovely painting called Fortuna, also known as Nemesis. I'm going to let this little video describe it for us. Durer called this engraving Nemesis in one of his diary entries, but it has also been referred to by the title Fortune by other writers at various times since the 16th century. In classical mythology, Nemesis was the Greek goddess of revenge and divine retribution, and Fortuna was the Roman goddess of luck. The deities shared a number of characteristics and attributes, and it may be that Durer has combined the two in one magnificent winged figure. This naked female floats above the clouds, balancing, but just barely, on a sphere that looks too small to accommodate her feet. Her balance, like luck itself, is unreliable. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. The large goblet she holds in one hand symbolizes her ability to offer rewards to those who deserve them, but in her other hand she carries a bridle, with which she can restrain anyone who becomes too proud of his or her accomplishments. The globe she stands on might be seen as a symbol of the earth, but the landscape depicted in the lower half of the print is not symbolic. It is a very real place, a small town in the Tyrol called Chiusa, about 60 miles south of Innsbruck, which Dürer passed through on his way to Venice in 1494. The town and its surrounding countryside have been drawn in astonishing detail. Its buildings, bridges, churches, and mountain passes all recorded with perfectly convincing naturalistic precision. The details that appear in the engraving are almost certainly based on watercolor studies made during the artist's journey. As this print demonstrates, in the hands of an artist like Dürer, copper plate engraving is capable of almost unbelievable subtlety. Now, finally, to conclude our Northern Renaissance, we have Hans Holbein the Younger giving us the ambassadors. So on the left is Jean de Dinville, who was aged 29, who was a French ambassador to England in 1533. And to the right stands his friend, Georges de Selve, who was aged 25 and at the time a bishop of Lavour. And he acted on several occasions as ambassador to the, em the Holy Roman Emperor, also to the Venetian Republic, and to the Holy See back in Rome. But now here they are hanging out in the court of the Tudors in England. So we've got, first of all, the emphasis on the individual, because they feel pretty cool, obviously, if they're getting an individual portraiture done, and then the role of the state, because now we have resident ambassadors in European history at this point. Also, you've got the tools of exploration there, indicating that now the world is becoming you know, somewhat of a smaller place because Columbus has discovered the new world at this point. Also, you can see a lot of different things such as uh, the celestial globe. You see a portable sundial and various other instruments used for understanding the heavens and measuring time. Uh, among some of the objects on the lower shelf is a lute and a case of flutes, a hymn book, uh, which happens to be a Lutheran hymn book, by the way, and a book of arithmetic. So there are certain details that could be interpreted, though, as references to contemporary religious divisions as well, because there is on the lute a broken string, if you looked close enough, and that may signify religious discord, while right next to it we have the open Lutheran hymn book, which may be a plea for Christian harmony. Which is ironic, because only a few years after this painting is being done, the Church of England will be formed when Henry VIII decides to bring in the Anglican faith and break from Rome. And so, and then in the foreground is kind of fun, because we have a little optical illusion happening here. If you take a look at, uh, uh, at this little spot right here, and then you tilt the picture ever so slightly, you can see that it is actually a skull, which is a symbol of mortality. You can never get away from it. There's always going to be mortality, no matter how cool or important you may be.
All right, thanks for watching.